This is the seventh in my series of speeches on the line item veto. Last week, we uh, followed Hannibal, the Carthaginian, Carthaginian general, to the Battle of Cannae, which occurred in 216 BC. On August 22nd, we then followed Hannibal to the Battle of Zama in North Africa, which occurred in 202 BC. At the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal delivered the greatest defeat ever suffered by the Romans and their allies. Broadly speaking, the allies were of two classes. One, the Latin allies, and two, the federated Italian states which were spread throughout the Italian peninsula. The allies did not uh, serve within the Roman legions, but they formed uh, separate detachments of cavalry and foot soldiers who uh, served under the control of the Roman consul or other Roman officer commanding the legions. The allies uh, constituted scores of communities, both tribal and uh, city, each of which had its own special treaty uh, with Rome. The allied uh, communities raised their own uh, detachments of soldiers and horsemen, and they equipped uh, the, their armies, but they received their subsistence from Rome, and they shared equally with the Romans in the uh, distribution of the spoils from the wars. The Battle of Cannae was one of the greatest battles of antiquity, and it was the bloodiest of all Roman defeats. At Cannae, the consummate military genius of uh, Hannibal was displayed, and his masterly tactics on that occasion uh, found admirers among the great commanders in all of the subsequent ages. He was able to uh, win a victory there over vastly superior numbers by forcing the Roman army to jam itself. He forced it to crowd itself densely into a struggling, helpless mass. A mass which was shut in on all sides, a mass upon which every blow told, and a mass which could give but few, few blows in return. In one afternoon, the Romans and their allies lost more men on the slaughter field at Cannae than the United States lost during the entire eight years of the war in Vietnam. A terrible, sinking feeling of utter despair and woe descended like a cloud upon the Roman citizens. 
when they heard the awful news of the carnage and destruction dealt by this latest blow at the hands of the Carthaginian general, Hannibal. Eighty senators were killed. Eighty Roman senators were killed, along with Consul Paulus, the two proconsuls, Atilius and Servilius, two questors, a former master of the horse under uh, Fabius Maximus, and 29 military tribunes. And yet the reaction, the reaction of the Roman Senate was to display its iron mood. The stamina of the Romans and the resiliency of the Roman political system were such that they were able to endure 13 additional years of devastation and ruin. Dealt by Hannibal before he left Italy in 203 BC to be defeated at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC by the Roman consul, Publius Cornelius Scipio, surnamed Africanus. The Second Punic War had ended, and yet there was hardly a mother within the walls of Rome who had not suffered the loss of a brother, a son, a father, or a husband. A heavy tribute had been levied upon the manpower of Rome. And the wastage of blood in the struggle was best seen in the reduced numbers of men available for military service. The Federated Allies had undoubtedly suffered losses just as great. The greatest losses fell upon southern Italy. where year after year the fields were laid waste and villages devastated by the opposing armies until the rural population had almost disappeared. The land had become a wilderness and uh, many towns had fallen into decay. It was a struggle that called forth a recrudescence of the old Roman virtues of courage, self-sacrifice, patriotism, and uh, religious devotion. We saw last week that uh, the Roman dictator, Fabius Maximus, who was chosen in 217 following the disastrous defeat of the Roman and Allied armies at Lake Trasimene. And by the way, the Battle of Lake Trasimene occurred 
2,210 years ago today, June 22nd, 217 BC. But we saw Fabius Maximus take steps to renew the religious ceremonies and to assure that the divine element would not be neglected. So by so doing, Maximus restored the uh, morale of the Roman people. And we saw the rugged patriotism of the Roman Senate when it uh, refused the offer of Hannibal to ransom Roman soldiers taken prisoner at uh, Kenny. The Roman Senate had reached its zenith. It had emerged from the Second Punic War more powerful than ever. And even though the will of the people was theoretically sovereign, after the passage of the Hortensian Law in 287 BC, from that time to the tribunate of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus in 133 BC, the Senate exercised a practically unchallenged control over the Roman state. The Senate was able to guide or to nullify the actions of the Roman magistrates, the tribunate, and the assemblies. It uh, assigned to the consuls their spheres of duty. It allotted to the other magistrates their commands. And all contracts that were let by the censors were only valid if they were approved by the Roman Senate. The Senate continued to exercise its absolute control over all expenditures from the public treasury. And through its influence over the magistrates and the tribunes, the Senate was able to control the legislative and the elective functions of the commission. Now, Mr. President, the treaty that ended the Second Punic War had imposed upon Carthage the restric restriction that she could not make war anywhere without the consent of Rome. This had the effect of making Carthage a client of Rome.
At the same time, Masinissa, the strong Numidian ruler, was uh, installed as a very loyal Roman client on the western and southern boundaries of Carthage. The Romans continued, perhaps exaggeratedly, to fear and suspect their former enemy. And they were therefore prepared to seize upon any pretext that would serve as an excuse for the destruction of Carthage. The, op the opportunity came from the uh, actions of Masinissa. This Numidian chieftain, knowing the restrictions imposed upon Carthage by the treaty with Rome, and understanding the attitude of Rome toward Carthage, attacked Punic territory frequently. Under the treaty, the Carthaginians, of course, could do nothing but appeal to Rome. But the numerous commissions they sent out commissions in those days, just as we do in our, ours. The numerous commissions that were sent out by the Roman Senate to investigate the complaints of frontier violations always decided in the favor of Massanissa. One member of one of those commissions that was uh, sent out to resolve the complaints of a border dispute was uh, Marcus Portius Cato, the elder, elder the elder. Cato was still obsessed with the fear that the invasions of Hannibal had uh, inspired in his early life. And Hannibal returned from his mission to Carthage filled with alarm at the wealth and the growing prosperity and strength of Carthage, which he considered to be a deadly rival of Rome. He therefore uh, bent all of his energies toward accomplishing the downfall of Carthage. And in all of his succeeding years, he closed he concluded all of his speeches in the Roman Senate with the words, Carthage must be destroyed. Friction with Massinissa resulted in a chain of events that led ultimately to the delivery of an ultimatum by Rome to Carthage. Rome instructed the Carthaginians to abandon their city and to resettle. Within at least 10 miles from the city. This was a death sentence. This was practically a death sentence 
to this mercantile city of Carthage, this ancient city. So the Carthaginians decided upon a last ditch defense of Punic interests. Their weapons had been taken from them by the Romans earlier. They therefore improvised weapons and manned the city's walls and defied the Romans. And thus the Third Punic War began in 149 B.C. For two years, the Romans, because of the incapacitation and incompetency of their commanders, and also because of the heroic and spirited defense of the city, Accomplished, accomplished little. Then in 147 BC, the Roman consul Publius Cornelius Scipio Emilianus, the adopted grandson of Scipio Africanus. was chosen. And he immediately went about uh, defeating the Carthaginians in the field. And uh, he energetically besieged the city. In the spring of 146 BC, Scipio Emilianus captured the city after terrible struggles in the streets and in the houses of the city. The Carthaginians, uh, those who were the survivors, numbering about 50,000, were sold into slavery. And their city was leveled to the ground. And the site upon which the city had stood was declared accursed. Carthage was no more. The territory of uh, Carthage was formed into a province a Roman province called Africa. In the same year of 146 BC, which witnessed the destruction of Carthage, the Greek city of Corinth The Greek city of Corinth was sacked and burned by the Roman cons consul Lucius Mummius, surnamed Achaicus. The art treasures of the city were carried off to Rome, and the inhabitants, like the inhabitants of Carthage, were sold into slavery. The other cities, the other Greek cities, entered into individual relations with Rome, some like Sparta and Athens, as Roman allies. The others were made subject and tributary. Mr. President, uh, time precludes me from 
making more than a passing reference to the Macedonian and the Syrian wars and other wars from which Rome emerged victorious. In 168 BC, the Roman consul Lucius Emilius Paulus, surnamed Macedonicus, won a complete victory over uh, King Perseus of Macedon at the Battle of Pydna. Perseus was taken to Rome where he was treated with scorn and ignominy, and he died there in captivity. The Macedonian kingdom, therefore, was brought to an end in 168 BC. During the Third Macedonian War, the Syrian king, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, invaded Egypt. And the Roman Senate, following the Battle of Pydna, dispatched an ambassador, Gaius Popilius Linus, to call upon Antiochus and to urge him to withdraw from Egypt. Popilius met with Antiochus at Alexandria, Egypt. And Propilius delivered the message to Antiochus that the Senate had sent, urging him to withdraw from Egypt. The Syrian king asked for time to consider. The Roman drew a circle around the Syrian king and bade him to answer before he left the spot. Antiochus yielded and pulled his troops out of Egypt. Cisalpin Gaul, that area of North Italy on the southern side of the Alps, bordering the Po River, had been largely lost to Rome during the Hannibal, Hannibalic invasion, but it was recovered by wars. In Spain, Scipio Emilianus, the destroyer of Carthage, destroyed Numantia in 133 BC. And the Carthaginian territory in Spain was organized by Rome into two provinces, hither Spain and farther Spain. In that same year of 133 BC, the king of Pergamum the king of Pergamum Attalus the 3rd Philometor surnamed Philometor died the last of his line. And in his will, he made Rome 
the heir to his kingdom. The kingdom of Pergamum was formed into a new province, the province of Asia. And the occupation of this territory by Rome made Rome the mistress of both shores of the Aegean Sea and provided a convenient bridgehead for Rome for further advances eastward. Now, Mr. President, when Rome embarked on the first Punic War in 264 BC, no Roman soldier had ever set foot out of Italy. But between 264 B.C. and 133 B.C., as we have seen, Rome became supreme throughout the Mediterranean world. From the earliest times, the Romans had believed that Rome had a providential destiny, smiled upon by the gods. The individual Roman believed in that sense of destiny for his country. And he also believed that it was his duty and mission to give his life if necessary toward the fulfillment of that providential destiny for his country. I also mentioned uh, in one of my earlier speeches that there were many parallels between the history of the Romans and the history of America. And as we have witnessed this territorial expansion by Rome, between the years 264 BC and 133 BC, it is evident that one of these parallels is that strong sense of national destiny. From the very beginning of our own history, as the distinguished senator from Mississippi will recall, the uniqueness of the American national mission has received religious and secular explanation. As he will recall from his study of American history, in 1630, in his sermon, John Winthrop exhorted his fellow travelers to New England. Men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill the eyes of all people upon us. And my good friend, the senator, senior senator of Mississippi, will also remember that 
after 200 years of westward expansion, which brought them to Missouri and Iowa, the Americans perceived their destined goal. The whole breadth of the continent was to be theirs. And it was for a man by the name of John L. O. Sullivan, a New York journalist, to capture this mood in one sentence. Nothing must interfere, he wrote in 1845, with the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence. For the free devel development of our yearly multiplying millions. Mr. President, for all of its existence, the United States Senate, or for most of its existence, I would say, the United States Senate has been the principal national forum for applying this powerful sense of destiny to the fundamental issues that have faced generations of America. And uh, it is not uh, too far from reality to understand what the histor historians have meant when they have identified the Senate's golden age. That period beginning in the second quarter of the 19th century with the start of fierce debates over the concept of our nation's structure and destiny. But whether the national destiny is to be defined in the territorial expansion in the 19th century since, or as the advancement of science and commerce, individual liberty, human rights, economic opportunity, or space exploration and travel. The United States Senate has played an indispensable role, as did the Roman Senate of 2,000 years ago. Mr. President, uh, the century that began uh, with the year 133 B.C. has often uh, been uh, referred to as the Roman Revolution. It was an era of increasingly bitter strife that erupted in bloody civil wars which ultimately destroyed government by oligarchy, brought about the end of the Roman Republic and replaced it with a disguised form of monarchy. Uh, which I think calls upon me at this point to again refer to the Magna Carta. As I did on last Tuesday, that being, that having been the 778th anniversary of the Great Charter, which was signed on July 15, 1215. At Runnymede, 
for the first time in recorded history. Representative, representatives of the governed. In that case, the English barons. Called upon the royal executive, King John of England. to account for his imperious behavior. And they coerced him into signing the agreement, which ever after required him to recognize a limitation upon his royal power. And out of that deed was born over a period of long and bloody centuries, the idea and the reality of representative government. Government in which there were limitations on the powers of those who govern. The Magna Carta is viewed as the basic keystone document in the Anglo-Saxon heritage of constitutional and limited government. And it is also viewed as the underlying foundation of our American heritage of the right of the governed to place limitations on the powers of government officials, especially the chief executive. Conversely, as the Roman Senate lost its will to shoulder its responsibility to act as a check upon the executive, more and more, the Roman Senate ceded power into the hands of those executives or imperators or emperors as they were later called, who finally, in fact, took power into their own hands. The ceding or transfer of these powers into the hands of the emperors resulted from the loss of will and courage by the Roman Senate. And they reflected the slow decadence and the agonizingly prolonged decline experienced by Rome by the collapse of the Republic and the emergence of the Empire. Now, what is what all this to do with the line item veto? What does all this Roman history have to do with the line item veto? Where is the relevancy? Well, I want to tell you. Robert C. Byrd is not the only individual by any means who has ever detected a relevancy between the line item veto and Roman history. The great Montesquieu author 
philosopher. wrote, as we very well know, the Persian letters and the spirit of the laws. But perhaps not many people know that Montesquieu also wrote a history of the Roman people, their greatness and their decline. He was intrigued by the Roman people, their history. And uh, he visited the various political divisions in Europe and stayed quite a period of time in England. And it was the contemporary institutions of England and Roman history that influenced Montesquieu in his philosophy, philosophy concerning the separation of powers and checks and balances. And as we all know, Montesquieu's philosophy of separation of powers and checks and balances had a great impact upon the framers of the United States Constitution. Those men who met in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 very well knew about Montesquieu. They were well read. They knew of his philosophy of separation of powers and checks and balances. And they drove that linchpin right into the center of the Constitution. And the power of the purse, of course, is the mainspring in that constitutional system of separation of powers and checks and balances. So Montesquieu saw it. I've seen it. What is the relevancy? To put, it, to put it simply and elementally, by delivering into the hands of a president, any president, Republican or Democrat or Independent, The United States Senate will have set its foot on the same road to decline, subservience, impotence, and feebleness that the Roman Senate followed in its descent. into ignominy, cowardice, and oblivion. Mr. President, will we stay with the spirit of Runnymede? Or will we go the way of imperial Rome? President, I yield the floor.